I'm trying to understand how you, you were comparing people now to those in 1850. And I'm trying to think of what were people eating in 1850 that was high in omega-3, which we're now no longer consuming at the same rate. Right. So uh, it depends on where you were, but you get some omega-3s in mustard seed or rapeseed oil or rapeseeds. Rape uh, those have fallen into this favor, except in canola oil. But canola oil is 10% omega-3, 24% omega-6. Uh, there's a little bit in soybeans. There's a little bit in walnuts. There's a little bit in hemp. There's a lot in flax and chia seeds. And in Asia, there's a, something called perilla, which is also very high in omega-3s. And then you What's find... That? Perilla is, uh, is, I think, perilla is the plant that chizo, chizo comes from. Like if you eat chizo mm. leaf with your sushi, uh, that comes from the perilla plant. So okay. the seed has, has a, a, a lot of omega-3 in it. And then there ha you have, there's kukui nut in the tropics. It's 30%. And psyllium seed, which in India they eat the seed. Here we only use the husk for bowel regularity. But the psyllium seed is 30% omega-3s. So every place has some sources of omega-3. They're just not in the food supply. And then when you're eating, uh, grains have very little omega-3s in them. So we eat a lot of grain products, you know. And, of course, before agriculture, we weren't, we weren't grain eaters because we didn't have fields of wheat and fields of uh, corn. Understood. Why is – this might be an odd question, but why is omega-3 so rare – in nature. There's something I, I heard you say in an interview I listened to once where you said something like, nature does not optimize for health. And I thought that was a really interesting sentence. And it sounds like it's somewhat connected to this. It seems strange that there's something that's so essential for our well-being and for our diets, but it's so it's so rare and hard to find. Well, so the the, the rarity has to do with the climate. You know, if the climate got really cold, you know, flax, which grows in the northern temperate zones and then, you know, and the higher, the further north you go, the more omega-3 is in the same flax plant. So if you go south to Dakota, which is the south end of where it grows, it's maybe 45% omega-3. But you go up into halfway up, a can up Canada in Saskatchewan or Manitoba, you get 63% omega-3 in the same grain. So from 45 to almost 60%, 18% difference. So the further north you go. So that has to, it's climate, so it has has a climate factor too. So if we get into another ice age where it gets cold further south, then omega-3s will grow further south. And you'll get more omega-3s in what grows further south. So that's so that's one issue. But the thing about the the body, you know, nature's mandate is not optimum health. Well, you know. People argue, so like, oh, well, she, we should just eat whole foods and then, you know, we'll be optimally healthy. No, nature doesn't need you optimally healthy. It needs you healthy enough to grow up, needs you healthy enough to reproduce, needs you healthy enough to take care of your kids till they don't need you anymore. And when your kids don't need you anymore, nature doesn't need you anymore. So then it's recycling time, you know, from nature's perspective. And how do you make sure that people are, re are recycled when their kids are grown? Well, you, had, you never have them optimally healthy in the first place. And then as the machinery slows down, the, med, the biochemical machinery slows down as you get older, then you get recycled earlier. And there was a time when, when most adults lived on an average of 34 years, 40 years. I, I yeah. also understand that was largely skewed because so many people died so early because the infant mortality rate was so high. My understanding on that That's statistic true. is that if people made it to four or five years old, then the probability that they'd live to, you know, 60 years plus was actually pretty high. That That's also true to some extent. There's definitely okay. people who made it through childhood. There definitely were some very people who lived very long and very old. But if you look at like all the famous people that you study, yeah, yeah, they usually checked out in their 60s, 50s, 60s. Yeah. 70 was hard, 80 was, but there were some people who, who did. And, yeah, for sure. what, and what is that based on? Well, it's based on genetics, but it's also based on lifestyle habits. Absolutely. And the people who have done best in health are the people who eat whole foods, not 
white flour, not white sugar, not white oils, you know, but they ate whole foods and then they were physically active and they had social connections, you know, and all of that. So yeah. there are a lot of factors in, in that. But the idea that nature's mandate is optimum health, I just had to question it because it didn't make sense to me. And mm. I then tried to get all my oils from just eating flax, sunflower, and sesame seeds to get the omega-3s and 6s right, like we have it in the blend, right? And within, within three months in California, in summer, where I need less oil, my skin was getting dry. I could not keep my skin from getting dry. So I couldn't get enough from just eating seeds. And that was always the argument. Why do you make oil? Why don't you just eat the seeds? So like, mm. because, because I need more than that. Some people might be able to do it just on seeds. I can't, All right? So I'm just going with what's working. It's, it's, it's a, for me, it's just a practical issue. I hear that. I have a, a massive question. Uh, yeah. Pardon the pun. Pardon the pun when I say massive, but uh -huh. What is going on, not just in the USA and across the West, but in terms of the overweight and the obesity rates? Every right. year, these numbers are just going up and up yeah. and up. I mean, it's gone. The obesity rate has gone from under 10% not so long ago yeah. to now being around 40% in the USA, for example. Yeah. Um, and it's not even the fattest country in the world. And I believe the percentage of people who are overweight or obese is now over 70%. And, yep. you know, as much yep. as people would like to cope and pretend that this is because there's all these bodybuilders and powerlifters out there, that's not really the case. It's, um, <laughs> Those so, are the only healthy overweight people are, are as Arnold and Arnold and his crew. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so what exactly, look, every, everyone's got there. Some of it is, some of it is obvious and we've touched on some of it, but it certainly seems like there is something a little bit more hidden and less obvious perhaps that has been going on in modern western diets which has just led to this massive continuous rise in obesity so what yeah. what is your analysis on that okay so there are two reasons two reasons why people get overweight three if you include arnold but there are two reasons why people become overweight and obese one is inflammation which leads to water retention and the other is more eating more carbs than you burn and when you eat more carbs than you burn especially when you eat eat them in a refined form where they're absorbed very quickly your body to protect itself will turn excess carbs that you don't burn into fats for storage and that mechanism was good during during times when there were feasts and famines but now we have no famines so your body stores the fat. If you had a famine, then the, the overweight people would, would survive longer than skinny people. But we don't get the famines. So we eat, we get overeat. And then, of course, there are social factors as well. Like, uh, you know, some, when, I, when I'm depressed, you know, sometimes food is my only friend. And then I'm eating for psychological reasons. I'm not eating when I'm hungry and I'm not stopping eating when the, the hunger has gone. That's what we're supposed to do. Right. But I'm eating because food is my friend and it's a nice entertainment and it's like, it feels good. And I like the taste and I like the texture and whatever it is, it becomes my entertainment. And then you live in a time where there's a lot of social pressure and people are anxious and people are depressed and people are fearful and they're confused and they're overwhelmed. And when you get stressed, one of the mechanisms, it's, it's very easy to overeat because when you're stressed eating, you're, you're basically bringing fuel in for the fight or flight that's about to happen. But our stress isn't fight or flight stress because it's not physical. There's nobody, there's no bears chasing, chasing us most of the time, right? We got stress, but we don't have any physical outlet for that. So we don't run like hell to ex escape it, we just sit, we sit and stew in our stress. And, and then overeating it is often part of that. Now we can, obviously, we have to be more deliberate these days than we used to be when there were no such things as white sugar and white flour and, and concentrated foods. Now the other thing in, with inflammation, when you eat sugar cane, you get the, you get the sugar, 
But in the cane, there's also antioxidants. They protect you. I call them spark control. You know, you want to build a fire in your body. That's your energy. But the bigger the fire, the more sparks it throws. So that means the more spark control you need. We call mm -hmm. those sparks free radicals, and they damage tissue. And then you get inflammation. The immune system produces inflammation because it tries to isolate whatever this, these sparks are and then take them down. But we don't have the antioxidants that take down the spark control. So we're going to get more inflammation. White sugar gives you inflammation. Why would white sugar give you inflammation? It's just, it's just a fuel molecule because it produces free radicals and we don't have the balance with the antioxidants and anti-inflammatories that we need. We've had people who like lost 60 pounds in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, in, in three weeks, 60 pounds of overweight. They just peed it out because it was inflammation. And when you deal with the inflammation, then the tissue shrink, the water is released, and you basically pee it out through your kidneys. Mm. Right? So, and so omega-3s turn into their own spark control. Omega-3s are build a really good fire in your body. So they give you lots of energy. That's why athletes do so, do so well on it. But part of the omega-3s actually turn into antioxidants. So it is the only molecule among all of our nutrient molecules that it both gives you the fire and protects you against the sparks. Same molecule is turned into spark control in the body. 80% mm -hmm. burnt for energy, 20% uh, turned into other molecules, including spark control and anti-inflammatory molecules. Kind of cool. That Omega-3. Yeah, it's like, wow, <laughs> who came up with that? <laughs> <laughs>